I'm going to present uh, a project. I, I will put my 15 minutes here. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to this multicultural schools and local heritage project. If we said that uh, archaeology was a tool for well-being, for operating and knowledge, it's also a tool for social cohesion. And I'm going to focus on multicultural communities. And uh, well, I am an archaeologist. My background is in uh, as an archaeologist, but I'm also I have a PhD in education. And then I, I try to work within the two uh, fields, yeah, with archaeology and education. And this project, it was made with different schools in Barcelona, what we call ancient schools that were built in the 19th, 20th century. And uh, well, uh, we, we have titled this slide, The School of Familiar Place, because as everybody knows, schools are the first context for learning social competences uh, outside the household for children three or five or six years old, depending on uh, the country, go to school is the first place where they learn social competences, apart from the public space or the public park where they go. The thesis of this presentation lies in the hypothesis that an increased interest in local or micro-local history also enhances place attachment or sense of place even more if that population, most newcomers, comes from different cultural and geographical backgrounds since the schools are often the only space, except in home, which they can feel as theirs, where they experience engaging daily personal and social relations and it's familiar to them. Just for a short introduction uh, to the historical context of the presentations, let me tell you that the project is about historical school buildings in Barcelona that were created from 1920 to 1939. Uh, maybe some of you already know about the history of this period, but maybe some of you not. During this specific period, before the Franco dictatorship that lasted from 1929 to 1979, Barcelona increased significantly its population due to the industrialization and most of this growing working class was illiterate and never had gone to school. In the same period, prior to Franco, public policies and social activism advocated for investment in education as a crucial main pillar to guarantee a cohesive and more equal society. Just as an example, some groups of teachers in Catalonia of that time were sent to Italy to receive lectures from Maria Montessori, an important Italian pedagogist, and other relevant figures such as De Croly, Freinet in France, with the aim to import their ideas about how to teach children through discovering hands-on activities, playing, etc. This idea was also expressed in architecture through the, through the concept that the schools, uh, it's a very nice concept, had to be palaces for students, for pupils. Architects captured this concept, designing very elegant, like this one, buildings with the white spaces and profuse decoration following the art style called Nocentisme, recovering Roman and Greek architecture ideas and opposite to modernism and rationalism. The question is now, how this past is lived, how this architectural past is lived in the multicultural 2018 Barcelona daily life. Barcelona, at the beginning of the 20th century, was a prominent capital with an industrialization growing process, as we said, accommodating half a million of inhabitants. Half a million. Today, Barcelona is a crowded city that has allocated one million and a half citizens, increased partly by people coming mostly from South America, Central Asia, North Africa, and Maghreb during the last 20 years. Which thing was moment which heritage can be shared by students from Pakistan, Morocco, Bolivia, or China living in Barcelona, in Catalonia. Which kind of attachment do they have with Barcelona heritage? 
their identity is not uh, belonging here, but it's their place of living. The answer developed in this project is the attachment <laughs> that they develop with a specific <coughs> small scale place they are living in. You can see here the same old school, it's Angel Vacheras. It's at the end of Via Layatano on the right hand side. And this is a picture, this is school, well at this time the education was for girls and for boys separately. And now they go together. This is a picture of the girls' uh, classroom at the beginning of the 20th century. And this is an actual picture where you can see in the Gothic area in Barcelona, there's a multicultural families living in it. And uh, well, these students are from different countries, from uh, more social poor countries, economical life, but also from Finland, from England, from France. From it's a, a very mixed uh, school class. It's a very rich, culturally speaking. Well, migration in Barcelona uh, is mostly coming from uh, these um, uh, Spanish-speaking countries, South America, uh, then from Europe itself and from Asia. And although we have a lot of images, uh, people crossing from Morocco, crossing the border with uh, Spain, the Africa migration is just 7%. No? We have a lot of misconceptions with migrations. Okay, th then go to the practical part of, of the, the, the speech. Many of those historical schools of Barcelona, built in Prefranco's time, are still functioning as a state schools in Barcelona and are located in neighborhoods with the highest immigrant population of the city, especially the quarters around the Ramblas. Families living in that area have low incomes and they choose the school for their children due to their proximity to their homes, not because they educational project or prestige. Uh, there are some um, statistics and essays that said that um, families with mid high uh, studies choose the school for their children because of the project and people uh, with primary school studies, uh, choose schools for their children because of the proximity. So the schools become part of the familiar, small landscape of these children. Home, way to school, school, and back home again. The school heritage project uh, uses this quotidian daily experience of children from very different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, to create a sense of common heritage related to these buildings and their exceptional history. Therefore, teachers create heritage experiences for multicultural students accommodated in historical schools, linking an unfamiliar past with a shared past. And how do teachers do that? Pupils redefine and reappropriate the values of this heritage by playing and living in it. As a second experience, people, pupils get immersed in the discovery process as a shared experience because it's not about cultural roots about cultural experiences in their daily material and familiar context, and the value of the discoverer past gives value to that place that children consider as their own. One of the first activities is children of the past and of the present. Uh, these activities are learning by doing and valuing by experiences. Uh, children of the past and the present are projects that intend to trace a link between the past and the present where the actual school children have the opportunity to discover the past of its school using ancient school materials to build knowledge and identification with children that attend the same school, and even a school room in the past. This material culture can be diaries, drawings of the pupils of the 30s, all maps and pictures, scientific instruments to study and to observe animals in the sun. A second group of activities other ones called discovering the school secret past is a strategy of a discovering process, just a starting point to continue doing research about the past of the school, playing on the playground and discovering the first stone of the school with Latin capitals letters, for example, yeah. and trying to decode what is written on it or discovering an old printer and using it to print the school. This as 
many of the educational systems, when you are on the first, second primary level, you start to learn how to write and how to read. And in one of these schools, uh, teachers found this first story in Latin, and then uh, the six, seven year old children started to know letters, just uh, uh, drawing these letters in, in a notebook. And then there is a third group of activities. It's called the school, the school as a living museum. And this strategy aims to make visible and to share with a wider community the school material culture and the uniqueness of the school's history. One example is the recreation of an old classroom to organize open days for families and neighbors where the children are the ones who leave the guided tours or to restore and use the old educational material like the collection of butterflies for the natural sciences lectures. It's not just important for the students, it's also important to empower the families of these students. Some conclusions. From the social inclusion point of view, there is still a deep evaluation study to do about the impact of these projects on the multicultural students. But from non-formal interviews with teachers and students, we can conclude that all these experiences enhance multicultural kids' play detection. The school is a common symbol and place where they feel different and equal. Putting in value this heritage and the whole process does not only affect to the students, even more families, as I said, and the whole school com community. And this makes the school more prestigious and attract more high and middle class students, benefiting in a more equal and non ghetto school. From the pedagogic point of view, the use of a very close and lived heritage reference motivates students to study the past and to learn critical thinking in analyzing history and daily life. As other scholars have mentioned, the increasing interest in local history as a tool to enhance place, place attachment reverts on the emotional bonds that people form with places that are meaningful to them. And that's all. Thank you.